On a June night in 2015, a 21-year-old white supremacist named Dylan Roof sat quietly for almost an hour in a prayer meeting at a historic black church in Charleston, South Carolina. Then he opened fire with a 45 caliber Glock killing nine people. In an online manifesto, Roof wrote, we have no skinheads, no real KKK, no one doing anything but talking on the internet. Well, someone has to have the bravery to take it to the real world, and I guess that has to be me. A month later, John Russell Hauser, a drifter from Alabama, stood up in a crowded movie theater in Lafayette, Louisiana, and started shooting. He killed a shop owner and a college student and wounded nine other people before taking his own life. Online, Hauser expressed interest in white supremacist and neo-Nazi beliefs, as well as espousing lone wolf tactics. In a 2014 posting, he wrote, you must realize the power of the lone wolf is the power that can come forth in all situations. Look within yourselves. In April 2014, former Ku Klux Klan leader Frazier Glenn Miller gunned down a 69-year-old doctor and his grandson in the parking lot of a Jewish community center in Overland Park, Kansas. Next, he went to a nearby Jewish assisted living facility and killed a woman who was visiting her mother. Miller is a longtime anti-Semite who regularly posted on a racist forum about wanting Jews dead. None of his victims were Jewish. In August 2012, racist skinhead Wade Page went to a Sikh temple in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, and he killed six worshipers. Four other people were wounded, including the first responding police officer, who was shot 17 times but survived. I'm Sergeant Corey Flowers with the Greensboro, North Carolina Police Department. Wade Page was just one of many racist skinheads I monitored during the years he was in my area. No warning bells went off for me that Page was a future mass murderer. There were no obvious signs that he would go on a killing spree. But Page, Miller, and Roof are all classic examples of a lone wolf, a person who carries out a terrorist attack entirely on his own, without direction or orders from a group or leader. While international terrorism is on everyone's mind nowadays, it would be a serious mistake to discount homegrown terrorists, especially those acting on their own. In fact, a 2009 report from the Department of Homeland Security said, quote, white supremacist lone wolves pose the most significant domestic terrorist threat because of their low profile and autonomy. Austin, Texas police chief Art Acevedo learned that lesson the hard way. In November 2014, a man named Larry McWilliams went on a shooting spree. He fired more than 100 rounds at government buildings, including the police department. In his van were propane cylinders he planned to use to firebomb other targets. McWilliams was a follower of the racist religious doctrine known as the Phineas Priesthood. Chief Acevedo summed up the threat when he said McWilliams was, quote, a homegrown American extremist. Hate in his heart was part of his problem. What keeps me up at night is these guys, the lone wolf. Lone wolf violence is on the rise, and we in law enforcement must learn to identify this deadly serious threat before more lives are lost. Years ago, KKK rallies and burning crosses signaled the threat of racist violence, but today organized hate groups are in decline. This is because many would-be recruits are congregating on the web and communicating through social media rather than joining organizations. For instance, Dylan Roof said a white supremacist website was the primary influence in forming his racist beliefs. Glenn Miller posted almost 13,000 times on the racist and anti-Semitic forum Vanguard News Network. The lone wolf style of attack has proved more successful than plots in the past that were planned by major group leaders. Lone wolves are self-motivated to organize and execute attacks without direction from others. Though Wade Page was a member of a skinhead group, he appears to have carried out the temple murders because of personal triggers. He lost his job and his girlfriend. He apparently had no communication with his group about his plans. But his many years in the racist movement informed his choice of a target. Law enforcement officers are also increasingly becoming the targets of domestic terrorists. A 2014 study from the Anti-Defamation League tracked 43 incidents from 2009 to 2013 that involved domestic extremists and law enforcement. These were cases where shootouts occurred. Extremists fired at police or officers had to use their weapons to protect themselves. 
white supremacists and anti-government extremists were behind 90% of the cases examined. A study by the Intelligence Project of the Southern Poverty Law Center examined 63 incidents from April 2009 to February 2015. It found that a domestic terrorist attack or foiled attack occurred on average every 34 days, almost every month. 63 people died in those attacks along with 16 assailants. Lone wolves were responsible for almost three-fourths of the incidents examined. Extremists worked in pairs in 10 of the remaining 16 attacks where the number of assailants was known. Only six cases involved three or more people. The study uncovered other key components of the attacks and the offenders behind them. A little more than half of the attacks were motivated by hate, including white supremacist and radical Islamic beliefs. The remaining attacks were triggered by anti-government beliefs, such as those held by sovereign citizens, who believe the government has no authority over them. Firearms were used in the majority of the incidents. 25% of the cases involved explosives. Other weapons, including arson fires and even a private plane, were used in 11%. The attackers were overwhelmingly male, with just seven female assailants. They also were much older than most violent criminals, who were usually 15 to 24 years old. The study found that the majority of the attackers, those whose ages were known, were between 30 and 49. A surprising number of them were much older. This suggests that lone wolves spend many years absorbing radical right ideology before finally committing violence. To these extremists, violence is the only answer. A former FBI profiler has documented the marked progression that terrorists go through to reach their ultimate solution. Joe Navarro, one of the founders of the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit, calls these extremists wound collectors. There are three distinct steps in their path toward violence, ideation, isolation, and action. In ideation, offenders form a specific grievance against a target, fixating on what they see as an injustice. They collect these grievances or wounds and nurture them, obsessing over them. It's during this time that the offender spreads his message to family or friends who either ignore the signs or think it's just talk and nothing will come of it. Once an offender's communications are ignored, he isolates himself physically and mentally. He retreats to the internet, where racist websites and forums reinforce his beliefs. This is when he becomes really dangerous because there is nothing to counterbalance his obsession. Escaping into cyberspace also makes lone wolves much harder to track, but there are some warning signs. In a two-year study of almost 100 murders by racist extremists, the Intelligence Project identified 10 characteristics shared by killers who were active online. All the extremists in the study were unemployed. All engaged in some type of public activism, like protesting or leafleting, before turning to the internet. Most of the incidents occurred at home because triggers of violence are often personal. They posted on more than one racist forum or blog. There was sustained online activity. Almost all offenders had been on racist forums for more than 18 months. They exhibited antagonistic behavior with others on online forums. There was a change in their regular posting patterns, either an increase or a decrease. They discussed violence as an acceptable solution to problems. Weapons were discussed. And a specific enemy was identified, whether someone of another race or religion or the government. Finally, the offender is ready to act on his obsession. As Navarro described it, extremists in that state of mind have a lot of anxiety, and the only way to relieve that anxiety is to kill or harm somebody. Experts agree that lone wolf attacks are difficult to prevent, so what can be done to combat them? Identifying and hopefully preventing such attacks is not just the responsibility of law enforcement, but also of the public at large. Everyone has heard the slogan, see something, say something. In dealing with possible lone wolf attacks, law enforcement needs to add the message of hear something, do something. Old friends of Dylan Roof, who reconnected with him shortly before the Charleston shootings, said they noticed changes in him, such as odd behavior and violent tendencies. His roommate said Roof had been plotting something big for months, that, quote, he wanted to make something spark up the race war again. But the roommate never told the authorities. Another friend took Roof's gun from him after Roof had gone on a racist tirade two weeks before the shooting. Many other lone offenders advertised their plans for violence in various ways. FBI profiler Navarro said, under ideal situations you're tracking, when did this individual start communicating this stuff? Who are his associates? 
Is the verbal attack becoming more vicious? And does it look like they are psychologically crossing this line where they've convinced themselves that violence is the only thing to do? In the past, it was easy to spot the haters in their hoods and robes, their shaved heads and jack boots, or their paramilitary uniforms. But times have changed, and so have our homegrown terrorists. That means law enforcement has to change the way we keep the public and ourselves safe.